On today's Locked On Thunder podcast, we're joined by Derek Murray of BasketballNews.com to talk about the 2022 NBA draft and how the Thunder could approach all four selections in this year's draft. All that and more coming up on today's Locked On Thunder podcast on the Locked On Podcast Network, your teams every day. You are Locked On Thunder, your daily Oklahoma City Thunder podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Let's get it going on the Locked On Thunder podcast, on the Locked On Podcast Network, your teams every day. I am your host, Rylan Styles. You can follow me on Twitter at Rylan underscore Styles. Follow the show on Twitter at LO Thunder Pod. On today's show, brought to you by Bet Online, we're joined by Derek Murray, who used to work inside the OKC organization to discuss the 2022 NBA draft. Again, today's show is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this year with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. And Derek, how are you doing today? Roland, I'm doing good. I appreciate you having me on. It's kind of crazy. We're under three weeks away from the draft, so everything's moving 100 miles an hour, but it's a fun time. We're three weeks away from the draft, uh, under that, like you said, and this is like your third Thunder podcast in a row, so I appreciate you hopping on. Kind of what, what is your background? Kind of what was your, your role within the organization a few years ago? Yeah, so I actually started in uh, the business office. I handled a lot of the season ticket accounts, um, a lot of the corporate accounts, uh, big spenders, everywhere from your individuals upstairs to your big dogs downstairs close to the floor. So that was my entrance into the NBA. Um, the short version, I, I sent Sam Presti an email as soon as I got here in 2016, said, hey, I'm the new guy. You know, I want to learn from you. I just have some questions. You know, I, I'm interested in doing you know, your job, your career, and I don't know where to start. And he was gracious enough to sit down with me at an Oklahoma City Blue game and just kind of point me in the right direction. And ever from there, you know, I've looked up to him both as a friend and a mentor. Um, from the Thunder, I ended up working at Sports Info Solutions, a basketball analytics company. We sold data to a lot of NBA teams. I've worked with Babcock Hoops as an NBA draft consultant. Um, I cover grassroots basketball, college basketball, a little bit of everything. So crazy path. Um, I still actually live here in Oklahoma City, and the organization as a whole will always you know, hold a near and dear um, spot in my heart. So you're based here in Oklahoma City, but you go all around and look at all these prospects up close and personal. So kind of what would a typical day look like for you, both in season and then now at this time of year? Kind of what what does just your day to day life look like? Yeah, it really depends on the month, honestly. Um, it kind of works out nicely because my wife is a teacher. So June, we're usually able to, able to spend a lot of time together. Um, but in the fall, you know, I help recruit AAU teams to come to. Um, the next pro hoops circuit, as well as traveling to college basketball and scouting those for Matt Babcock. So I'm on the road a lot, especially November, December, January, um, you know, March, uh, February, March, it's big college tournaments, um, conference tournaments, March madness, as well as your big high school events. Um, you know, your Geico nationals, um, stuff like that down in Florida, the summer it's NBA draft workouts, it's summer league, it's pre-draft stuff. Um, a lot of our agency deals, you know, we're, we're advising a lot of these players on how to handle the pre-draft process, as well as at Next Pro Hoops this year, we have nine AAU tournament weekends as well. So I'm all over the country covering those. So every week is different. Um, I have learned to treasure the days that I'm here in OKC, just kind of working from my computer in my office um, and what my wife does too. So honestly, it's pretty seasonal. Um, but right now, again, mostly for the next two and a half weeks, mostly draft related stuff. Um, and just, just, you know, hundred miles an hour. That's probably the only way I can really explain it for right now. So you mentioned that, you know, you, you consult with prospects and talk about the pre-draft process and worked within the thunder, of course. So kind of, what does that mean whenever fans start seeing on Twitter that so-and-so has worked out with the thunder or any team in general, what kind of goes on at a pre-draft workout and what can the teams learn and, and how does it justify moving a player up or down draft boards? What kind of, what kind of, can you tell based off of that individual workout? Yeah, if a player has a, or if a team has a player in for a workout, the general assumption is there's at least some level of either interest in the prospect, interest in drafting them, or interest in, you know, we like the film enough, we want to see how we feel about them as a person. Um, you know, you're going to get to see them work out with the other players that you bring in, whether it's four, five, six, seven guys. 
And that competition level is really important. So you get to see that aspect of it. Uh, a lot of it is just how do they mesh as a person inside your organization, potentially, you know, what kind of teammate are they going to be? What just overall vibe and aura do you get from them? Is this a player you want in your organization, in your locker room, on your team plane, you know, that kind of stuff. And while it, a lot of it is basketball related, getting a feel for the skill level, maybe how big a player is, how they move. Um, it's as much personal as well. You know, how are they going to fit as a, as a kid, as a 19, as a 20 year old, if you choose to bring them in. So, so it's basically like a job interview where you're you're looking at how they perform, but also looking at how they interact and how they kind of be a, a co-worker, so to say. Yeah, that's the best way to look at it is how do they fit just overall collectively? What does it look like both short term, both small picture and big picture if we bring this guy in? So w- workouts, uh, I believe there's a lot of lot of value in that. And there are times where teams who – you know, aren't picking close to the top will bring in their top, you know, those top prospects kind of what's the value in that. I remember the story about the Thunder bringing in Trey Young for a draft workout whenever they weren't in any of the range to get Trey Young at all. So like what kind of what's the value of teams bringing guys in like that who, you know, won't be there whenever you're picking? Yeah, I mean, on one hand, you never know who is lurking in the dark, willing and ready to trade up to one of those top spots. So you can never assume that just because a team, you know, isn't doesn't look like they're going to have a pick or, oh, they're only picking in the 20s this year. But that doesn't mean they're not going to, you know, un- unload the un- uh, the bank and move up. You also have to get a feel for these guys when you can because you don't know where you'll be as an organization in two years, in three years. You know, what if something happens? And, I mean, I don't think three years ago, let's be honest, when, when Dame hit that huge shot in Paul George's face a couple years ago, I remember where – it's just one of those classic Thunder moments. Like, I remember where I was, who I was with, all that kind of stuff – on that day, the assumption was, okay, Portland's here. Like, Portland's here, and they're going to start winning, and this is it. You know what I mean? And then a couple years later, here they are now at the top, and things just haven't gone their way. Dame's been hurt. Some stuff hasn't worked out. You know, now they have number seven overall pick. Sometimes it's good for them to know, okay, who in previous drafts were available at the top that maybe we want to go try to get now with number seven and whoever you know, in a hypothetical trade. So if you have an opportunity to meet one of these people, even if you don't have the picks to get them now, it's always, you know, I'm of the opinion that it's worth your time. It's worth the resources and energy to meet everybody you can, to meet all the players you can, because in three years, you don't know if maybe you're going to have to trade for them or go get them or all of a sudden, you know, Mo Bamba is a good example. At the top of that draft, his value is not quite as high now as maybe it was when he was drafted there are going to be a lot of teams try to go get him this off season. And I think the ones that have the advantage are the ones that maybe interviewed him before that draft and know him personally. And even if they weren't, you know, in that draft range. And so I think that you're just kind of a great resource to use for fans and kind of to kind of explain how all of this truly works. So I want to talk one more thing about draft philosophy before we dive into the names of the 2022 NBA draft. But one thing that I'm always interested in is how can, how can you judge, ceiling and potential besides just saying well, this guy's 19 and this guy's 22 are there any certain things you look for where you're sitting at home scouting or seeing them in person scouting that make you believe okay this guy can improve defensively even though on film his defense is not there yet or this guy can improve his shooting even though he's only shooting 30 percent are there little tells that you can use besides age to see how a guy will progress yeah i think for me personally there are two things one is the pre-college tape what does he look like in EYBL, 3SSB, in the, in the UAA circuits? What does he look like? You know, A.J. Griffin's a guy who I'm sure many Thunder fans have somewhat at least familiarized themselves with. There are concerns now about his injury. How is he going to move? How is he going to defend on an NBA floor? Well, let's just be honest. Two years ago, that high school film before he got hurt looked like a top five pick and was one of the most dominant players on the floor every single night, no matter where he was playing basketball. <laughs> so people who have A.J. Griffin very high in this draft – I think they really buy that pre-college tape. You know, what did that look like? What was it then? Maybe before injury in a different role. You know, Cole Anthony was one too, who if you watch his high school tape versus what he put on tape at Carolina, I don't want to say it's vastly different, but the floor was spaced differently for him. North Carolina, there was really some issues clogging the paint. He wasn't able to showcase really his value as a scorer, where if you just roll the tape back eight, 10 months, He's probably the most dominant scorer on the floor night in and night out. So I think that's one thing. The other thing for me is athleticism. 
you know, the NBA is a different game compared to college. And at every sport from college to pro, it's just different. Your pitchers throw harder in baseball. Your linebackers and defensive ends run faster in football. And in basketball, everybody's just a different level of athlete. And there are exceptions. You know, there are guys who are not elite athletes who end up being some of the best players on the floor. I mean, you look at Devin Booker. He's not some blow you away elite, you know, physical freak. And he's still one of the best players in the game. So, like, there are kind of outliers, if you will. But in this year's draft, I look at a guy like Jabari. I look at a guy like Matherin, you know, like Ivy, like Sharp. The athleticism that those guys have, both frame, height, length, the way they move, their verticals, like they are NBA athletes day one when they step out on the floor. Now, where there, will there be growing pains skill-wise? Absolutely. Um, but those guys, there's a little bit of me of like, okay, athletically, they're going to be able to compete right off the bat, which I believe gives them an, ex- um, an advantage long-term. Um, it gives promise to a ceiling. So coming up, we're going to talk all about the 2022 NBA draft. Who's at the top for pick number two? Kind of who could the Thunder get at 12, 30, 34? Everything about the 2022 NBA draft specifically. But first, I want to say right now, but good friends over at betonline.net, your number one source for all betting needs, stats, and info. Find the latest sports developments, news, and odds, including this year's NBA championship, the NHL hockey championship finals. Major League Baseball, and of course, MMA, UFC, and everything else. So BetOnline is where you want to go for the NBA Finals and everything else like that. It's very easy to get to. Just type in BetOnline.net, and then you go to their sports book, and you can see all their lines for baseball, basketball. Let's dive into the NBA Finals tonight. The Celtics, four-and-a-half-point underdogs on the road despite taking game one. Derek, where would you land on that line? Uh, I'm going to take Boston. That's big. I like that. I like that pick. Of course, you'll know if uh, we were right or wrong. I'm going to side with Derek and go Boston two plus four and a half. So you'll know by the time you listen to this, we're right or wrong and lost some money or not. But it's always fun betting at Bet Online. We are back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your teams every day. I'm your host, Roland Styles, joined by Derek Murray of basketballnews.com. And I want to tell you right now, thank you for listening to Locked On Thunder, but we have a very important favor to ask you. Check out the Locked On Podcast survey. It tells us what you like, what you don't like about Locked On Podcast by going to LockedOnPodcast.com slash survey. Now, Derek, it's time to just dive right into the 2022 NBA draft. And the first question I have is just a broad question. In your opinion, for somebody who's seen these guys in high school and college at the Combine, have gotten feedback on their private workouts, how much talent is in this draft class? Is there enough talent to warrant drafting at 2, 12, 30, and 34 for the Thunder? I believe that there is this year, um, especially for the teams who like to shoot for superstars at the top, um, who like to shoot for upside in the lottery, and then like to find role guys kind of at the end of the first and early second. And again, I say this, no one knows what the Thunder are going to do. But just on kind of looking at how the Thunder have drafted the last couple of years, upside at the top, and then you've got like your, your JRE was a very telling pick to me at 32 or whatever it was last year. And even the other guys they were linked to of, okay, those are not potential superstars, but th- those are elite high-level role players who can play 82 games, get you to the playoffs. Um, and I think at 32 and 34 this year, or whatever it is that Thunder have, um, they're in the second I think are going to be very, very good picks. They're going to be great players available. So if I, if like, if, if they just stand pat and they make four selections, it's hard for me right now to kind of second guess that in any way. Um, no, granted, people will fall. People will be taken early. By default, there will be talented guys pushed towards you where maybe you see a guy go at seven or eight and you're, you think, oh no, like, I don't think my guy, you know, A, B, or C will be here at 12 anymore. Do we need to go get him at 10? You know, that will happen. But just kind of two and a half weeks out, generally speaking, I do like all four spots, and I think you can get a ton of talent. So you mentioned the Thunder philosophy previously in previous drafts, even last year. What is your own personal philosophy this year for 12? Would you go high upside at 12, or would you go with a more kind of safer pick with the 12th selection? Yeah, I don't uh, (laughs) – I don't ever really go too much into my own philosophy for the same reason the Thunder do, uh, Thunder doesn't. Um, right. Just even as an evaluator, as a media guy, as a scout, as a consultant, you know, it, it's an advantage if people don't know what I like. That being said, at 12, based on what the Thunder need, based on what on that roster, it's like, okay, they need kind of A, B, and C. 
I would love them to see a guy or I would love to see them take a guy with some offensive upside. You know, right now, number 12, we have Malachi Branham mocked there from Ohio State. And I would absolutely love that fit. He's going to be a great offensive player. He's an all-time great kid. He's killing interviews. Name was buzzing at the combine like crazy. And I think he's firmly a lottery guy now. Um, so I look, at, I look at him. If for some reason Johnny Davis is there, if A.J. Griffin's there, you know, I no longer think that you know Dyson Daniels or Matherin are going to slip to 12 in any way. I think that they're just going to go ahead. Um, but again, some offensive upside is probably where I would lean if you stand pat at 12. Let's say somehow for the Thunder, it worked out to where Johnny Davis and Branham are both there. It's some crazy world that we just can't foresee right now. Where would you lean knowing that, that you know, I agree with you that the Thunder should take offensive upside. I, I don't buy into some fans kind of wanting to just fill that center need because they need a center. I don't think that the Thunder should draft for a need right now, and especially not the center position. I do agree. Offense should be kind of what they look for. Who would you give the edge to offensively if you're going to bet on their offensive upside at the NBA level, Johnny Davis or Branham? For me, that answer is Branham. Um, now, I did a big podcast for Nick, for the Knicks the other day. And, you know, at 11, let's say they're both there, A.J. Griffin's there. I'm taking Johnny Davis for the Knicks every time, just based on where they are as an organization, where they are roster construction-wise. For the Thunder, I think that Branham of those three guys has the highest offensive ceiling. For Thunder fans who haven't seen much, go and watch – especially film from the second half of Big Ten play for Branham. I mean, he went from a kid trying to figure it out. I think he was – I don't even remember what he was ranked in high school. I know he was a top 50, but I don't remember how high. Just trying to figure it out. Was turning the ball over a lot. Um, and then we got to talk to him, you know, Matt and I did, and there was a conversation where he said he talked to Coach Holtman. And it was he basically said, I'm, I'm sorry for the way I've been playing. I will get it together. And from that point on, he was 20 plus points a game. It was just automatic on all three levels, getting whatever he wanted at will. You know, and at six five, good length, just really, really smooth, both from three, can get to the rim, mid range killer. Um, you know, he's the guy that offensively I look at. Let's say all you know, all those guys click. Uh, I think he gives you the best offense in five, six, seven years. So circling back to the top, kind of. What's your gauge on Jabari Smith Jr., Paul Carroll, Chet Holmgren, even throwing in Jaden Ivey into that? Kind of, you know, we hear a lot that this draft is just separated by a razor's edge, and and there's no clear cut one. Like last year, clear cut, Cade was going to be everybody's number one, or Zion was going to be everybody's number one, LeBron, everybody's number one. Since that's not the case this year, where's where's your read on how to separate these guys? If you had to bank on one of them being the best, kind of, how, where do you land on the top of this draft? My answer changes by, I'd still say the minute at this point. Um, I mean, I can listen to arguments for all four. You can talk me into all four, and I can talk you into all four. Um, I think at the end of the day, gut check time, Jabari's the guy that I would take at number one. Again, 6'10", moves really, really well, has tremendous defensive upside as well as offensive upside. Um, still has to learn how to put it on the deck and create for himself on the perimeter. Not necessarily a pick and roll guy at all. But I think he's going to be a tremendous shooter, an elite shooter early in his career. And if he's locked in on defense, he's really, really difficult to score on. He's a guy that I think, you know, talking to players who played against him this year in the SEC, they told me, they said, Derek, his mission for 40, 40 minutes was to make sure that we knew he was better than us. <laughs> and I love that mentality in the guy that you take at the top. Um, it's one of the other reasons that I love Ivy. And a lot of NBA teams have Ivy up there at one or two as well. You know, he's the ultimate alpha. He's an absolute killer. He played in an offense at Purdue where he had two immobile seven-footers on the block almost all times in a half-court set and was still able to showcase his elite burst and explosion to get to the rim. So I think his offense translates. You're looking at a – you know, John Morant's kind of the easy one, if you will, um, but I don't think Ivy's necessarily a point guard. So you're looking more a D. Wade, Donovan Mitchell type kind of – archetype, if you will. I think you're looking more that style of player than a point guard. And then Chet, best rim protector we've seen in college basketball in years. The timing, uh, the innate ability to, to block shots at the rim is special. And I know he was bumped around because of the weight. And when you get inside, it doesn't matter. <laughs> He's still going to block absolutely everything because it's just in his nature to not allow you to score. I also think he's going to be a 40% three-point shooter off the spot up on the offensive end. I see him more as a, a catch-and-shoot stretch five 
than I do necessarily a, you know, pick and roll guy or anything like that. I don't think he's a huge offensive initiator on the perimeter. Um, and then Ben Caro, I think of the three is the most ready to come in and give you offense on day one on NBA floor. His skill set as a shot creator, um, he's probably the best on ball passer of the three, at least of the three bigs, uh, better than Jabari and Chet. Confident when he's stepping into his shot, there's nothing you can do, even from three. And at 6'10, 250, he's bigger than most NFL defensive ends and <laughs> moves like a guard and can put it on the deck. So, again, I go up and down. There are arguments for all four at any spot in the top three. At this point, Based on everything I'm hearing, I, I think it is still Jabari at the top, unless this is one of the best smoke screens we've seen in a while. So Jabari's probably the guy at one, at least based on kind of what our prediction is today. And then a lot can change between now and then. So uh, if you if you don't feel comfortable answering this question, that's totally fine. We can move on. But you, you mentioned there about Jay Nivey getting into the top three, and we've spent this entire process thinking – it's the top three is clearly Paulo, Chet, Jabbar, and then it's a fight for four, five, six, and the rest. Are, do you think that now it's trending to where by the time we get to draft night, Jay Nive will be in that top three for some NBA teams? Yeah, I think a lot of the media did a disservice this year in just assuming it was a big three. Um, you know, Matt and I were hearing in December that NBA teams had Ivy at one uh, from some from some people we had trusted or do trust, excuse me, and and uh, they still have him there now. So I think it's been a big four in the draft this whole year. Um, will Ivy go top three? I have no idea. If he if he doesn't, I get it. How do you not take one of those three bigs up at the top? <laughs> um, it will also would not shock me if someone traded into the top three to take Ivy. So again, I fully expect it. You know whether or not they go one through four in some order. I don't know. Keegan Murray. Somebody could trade up to four to get Keegan if he's there. I could see somebody trading up to take Sharp or Dyson Daniels you know, at four, if, if, if they are there and they want one of those guys that badly. But I do think as teams evaluate where they are up at the top, I think that those four in some order are probably at the top for everybody. Coming up, let's talk more about Jaden Ivey, then shift into the rest of the draft on how the Thunder can find some value at picks 30 and 34. We're back on the Lockdown Thunder podcast, on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your teams every day. Thank you for checking out Lockdown Thunder. Check out Lockdown NBA Big Board for your next podcast that you listen to. But Derek, you said some very great stuff on Jaden Ivey, especially uh, some stuff that I think that will hit the ear funny for the audience that is listening because whenever we see these smoke screens about Jaden Ivey, it, it, of course, catches you off guard because of, like you said, the media has portrayed it as it's these three guys, then figure the rest out who cares, but it's these three guys that are the prize. And now as it gets closer to the draft, you're hearing the rumors of Thunder like Ivy or the Kings want to trade up and the Thunder want to get Ivy at, you know, four and just kind of sh shifting things around now, the narrative anyway, up into the draft. But you said there he's not a point guard in your eyes in the NBA. He's more of a of a guy like Mitchell or Wade. So with that being said, let's just say that these rumors are true and that the Thunder not only like Ivy, but want to draft Ivy and then do draft Ivy. So we're now talking June 24th, me and you, on this same podcast, recapping the draft, and we know that Jay and Ivy is a member of the Thunder. How would you project the fit between him, Giddy, and Shea, especially whenever we've kind of already had a little bit of questions about Giddy and Shea's fit together? Now you're adding a third wrinkle into that. Yeah, I, I like his fit because he doesn't have to have the ball in his hands all the time. You know, personally, I don't love a fit of like a, like a pure point guard coming to OKC. Do not get in Giddy's way of development. Do not get in Shea's way when he wants to run the offense. Those two guys are too good at what they do, in my opinion, to bring in like a pure one um, and add them to the team. But again, you add him, he's a guy who excels off the ball, um, who excels getting downhill and opens up the floor with, I mean, just elite, an elite first step and ability to create. You know, you look at how the Sixers have used Tyrese Maxey. Maxi in a redraft goes considerably higher than he did in that draft, which I think was 21, two, three, something like that. Um, the NBA floor, when you space it out, you go five out. Maxi just operates at will. And I believe that Ivy is going to do that possibly at an even more at a, at a higher level at a better level than Maxi does. So he doesn't have to have the ball. He's a guy that drive and kick as well. So you can play him with Shea. Shea's going to get plenty of spot up shots if that works. Giddy can still be your pure one because you can play Ivy off the ball. 
Um, I just think that three guard lineup, you know, the definition of a three guard lineup is different when I think you have a six, seven and a six, eight guy out there. You're not looking at, you know, three guys who are six twos at that point. It'd be what six, seven, six, eight, six, four. That's pretty big. Um, and, and you've got guys who are all aggressive and they all see the floor very, very well. So I like the fit if that's what they choose to do because he doesn't have to have the ball and isn't going to take it a lot from those young guys. I think that's interesting, kind of kind of calming the nerves of Thunder fans whenever you see these Jaden Ivey smoke screens. And, and you know, being here and being around this organization, whenever there's any leaks in OKC, there's half the group that freaks out, half the group that says, well, this is obviously false because nothing ever leaks from OKC and just refuses to believe anything. And then there's another quarter that just says, well, whatever Sam Presti does is, is incredible. And that's typically the right side to fall on because Sam Presti always does a pretty good job in these situations. But if the Thunder could play mind games with Orlando on June 23rd. And just, you can assign them anybody at the first pick. Walker Kessler is the first overall pick. So the entire board's left for OKC at two. Who is the best prospect that if, if in your opinion, the Thunder get him on June 23rd, there should be parties in the street of Bricktown right then and there. I mean, if you can walk away with from this with Jabari, I mean, home run. Set the fireworks off in Bricktown light up the street. Like, <laughs> I think that would be amazing. Paolo would be awesome. Chet would be awesome. Ivy would be awesome. But for me, again, you kind of need it. You need a big, you need defense, you need shooting. Jabari is the answer for all three. Um, Jabari, I think his versatility with the way he moves, you can play him with a five. And that is where a little bit, if you want to get nitpicky on what does this look like down the road, Chet with a pure five can look a little interesting depending on how you want to use him. Paulo doesn't move the greatest on defense. There are some questions on who he defends, who he guards. Can you play him with a five? Is he your five? But Jabari, it's like, okay, this guy's my four, and I know I can play him that as a four on both ends. I've got a potentially very high-level defender, a guy who is just incredibly, incredibly competitive and edgy and chippy. And then on defense, I'm going to get a 40% three-point shooter who moves well at six foot ten. So, again, I think he has the highest upside. And if Orlando were to take Chet at that point, all other smoke screens, me personally, I'm going, the, Jabari's got to be the guy here. I, I totally agree with you. I have Jabari number one on my board for every team and especially the Thunder. Everything you said is incredible. And to me, uh, a bonus on top of the, the, you know, the cherry on top is, I think that he's the least person to get in the way of Shea and Giddy's development because he benefits from everything both those guys do. He benefits from Giddy's elite playmaking, and there's no other guy in this draft that would benefit more from, at least at the top of it, from SGA's elite drive and kick ability. I mean, SGA sucking the defense in, kicking out to Jabari Smith, that's just going to be incredible for the Thunder. And I do want to add, I do want to ask you what my personal belief has been this entire process. I think that Jabari Smith, as a rookie, adds the most wins of this entire class. If you were going to measure them only in their rookie season, only next year, on, in like some sort of sabermetric like baseball has of like war, wins above replacement for a rookie, I think that, that Jabari Smith Jr. will come in and impact the game and win you more games than any other rookie uh, in this class. I actually think Jabari is second in that. Just me personally, I think that Ben Caro is the guy that if he's on a team drafting near the top, again, that – the assumption is that they would have been a tanking team or not a very good roster. I think that his offensive skill set comes in and scores you a lot of points pretty early in his career. And a lot of that is because he's the one of the big three that I'm comfortable giving the ball at the top of the key as a rookie and saying, I need a bucket. I need a bucket. I don't care how you get it. I don't care if you drive. I don't care if you hit somebody off the step, off the step back. I don't care if you pull up on the elbow. Like I think Ben Caro is the guy that gives you that instant offense as a rookie. Um, I think Jabari's upside is higher. I think Chet's defense is obviously considerably greater than Ben Caro's. But I do think that early on, if Ben Caro's given a role where, you know, he's getting 25, 30 minutes a night, uh, you're probably looking at rookie of the year is just would be my early prediction um, in that first year. But then I would definitely put Jabari at second. I like that pick as well. It, it's kind of silly to say this for somebody who's mocked consistently number three and just kind of is like sharpened into Houston. But like, it feels like Paulo is 
kind of the forgotten about guy. It's like, okay, are the Magic going to go Chet or Jabari? And then it's like, oh, here's an Ivy smoke screen over here. And then ah, Apollo, just go to Houston. Who cares? Like, we'll deal with that come summer league or whatever. But he is a really talented guy. And if somehow, you know, the Magic surprised us or the Thunder surprised us, it'd be warranted with Apollo. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we had Apollo mocked there for a while, kind of right after the right after the combine, after the lottery. I read an article from uh, ESPN the other day that Houston is discussing internally Jaden Ivey and Jalen Green as a pairing there in the backcourt, which first off, that would be a nightmare to defend in a couple of years when they both hit their stride. Like, that's a problem. But again, if you're Houston, can you justify taking Ivy over Ben Caro? I think you can because that fit is really interesting. If you have Ben Caro, you just traded two future first to go up and get Shengun. Again, they're different players. They're different styles, but they're two 6'10", 200 and you know, 30, 40, 50 pound bigs who don't move very well on the defensive end, how much can you play them together? I think you do a high-low thing on offense, but again, one of Ben Caro's strengths is that he can post you up and is super creative on the block. I don't know if you can have him on one block and Shingun on another. I think that just becomes a cluster. So I think them discussing Ivy to pair with Jalen Green becomes interesting. Then all of a sudden, does Ben Caro slip to four? If he does, I don't think it's indicative of his scoring or potential at all because, like I said, I think he gives you the best offense out of anybody in the class on day one. So I don't know. That's why That's why I just think whether or not it's number two, I don't know. But I think somebody trades up into that three or four spot to go and get their guy. And their guy could be Paolo, could be Ivy, could be Keegan. Maybe it's Daniels. Like, I don't know. It just wouldn't shock me if, if picks, you know, if two of those top four picks end up getting moved. And you mentioned right there, you know, it's just nothing would shock us on draft. Like there's always going to be surprises uh, that, that just we don't see coming as of right now, especially three, you know, two and a half weeks away from the draft. So it's hard to get you to earmark guys for 30 or 34, but just kind of in general for this draft, you mentioned how you view it as a pretty deep class. Who are some sleepers that in your opinion could be there in 30 or 34 or could be around at 12 or whatever? Who are some guys that you think aren't getting enough recognition that you really like in this draft? Yeah, this, this year, I'll preface just like every year. When you get to the back end of the first and early second, you really have to start weighing out internally. Confidence, safety, how high is the floor? Are they an 82-game guy who's going to get us to the playoffs? And what supremely talented youngster who has a little bit of boomer bust in him but is still here that we have to bet on? And that is just what's going to be very telling to me. That's where I look kind of when I study teams and predict what they'll do. I look at previous drafts. Okay, what did this team do at 30? What did this team do at 34 historically? Do they take a guy like JRE or do they swing for the fence with somebody else? So looking at this year, let's say you go a little bit of the, quote, safe route, where it's like the, the ceiling isn't crazy high, but the floor is really high, and you're getting at a minimum a role guy for at least an entire rookie contract. I think you're looking at a guy like Jake LaRavia from Wake Forest, has a lot of fans around the league and is buzzing right now. Um, I think you're looking at a guy like Christian Coloco, Wendell Moore Jr. from Duke is one. Um, Christian Braun from Kansas is one. I think those names kind of pop out to me as, you know, if they're there at 30, 34, and we're looking for guys just to come in and be role players, I think they fit very well. Great teammates. They have a specific role, and they excel in that. Um, some of the guys who I think have really, really high potential, but a little bit of we don't know how this is going to work yet. You look at Max Christie from Michigan State. He's a 6'6 wing. I think he's going to be amazing in the NBA. You look at uh, Kendall Brown, the forward from Baylor. You look at Bryce McGowans from Nebraska, uh, Josh Minot from Memphis, um, Peyton Watson from UCLA, who goes from five-star to playing maybe seven minutes a game in college, and then he declares. And it's really kind of crazy. You know, those kids have such high upside, but if certain things don't click, there are going to be some significant problems. So – just me personally, I have 30 and 34. If, if that's the way it you know shakes up for me, I probably take one of both. <laughs> like, um, but that's where that's where no one knows what the Thunder will do. I don't know what they're thinking for this. No one does. Wouldn't shock me if they paired 30 and 34 to go get somebody who maybe slips into the teens. You know, I don't know. But those names, depending on what you or whoever listening thinks that the Thunder should do, um, those are some names that I would look at and study a little bit that have some real potential. And I want to ask you one other question about just kind of your in general job of evaluating these players and ranking them or whatever. 
we have two very interesting case studies in this year's draft in Leonard Miller and Shaden Sharp. And, and Leonard Miller can still decide to go with the G League Ignite program and, and, and not enter the draft. So we're not for sure as of right now if he's going to be in the draft. But how would you grade out Leonard Miller in this year's draft if he decides on you know June 13th to stay in? Yeah, uh, this is they are very difficult to evaluate. And anybody who goes on any podcast or show and says, yeah, I got a great feel for them both. I know that. Yeah, they're lying to you. Like they are they are very difficult to evaluate with very little film. Um, and the competition level you've seen, you've seen the playing against just isn't that great. So I think if Miller were to stay in this draft, I think you're looking 25 to 35, probably maybe 20 to 35 is probably the range that I would put on if I had to guess. Like, yes, the physical tools are really, really enticing. And he's versatile for a young kid. I think he's 18 right now because the way the Canadian school system is set up, he's eligible, even though he just finished high school, all this stuff. So I think he would be picked late first, probably mid to late first, if I had to guess, uh, if he stayed in. Based on calls I've gotten, apparently, you know, wouldn't shock him if he went to the G League. I think Ignite is a very real possibility for him. He is not currently in our mock draft for that reason. So I think he'll go to the G League just based on some calls I've gotten. Have not confirmed any of those. Um, Cause I'm not, I'm not a newsbreaker and doesn't necessarily matter to me. I'll, I'll evaluate you wherever you are. So he, and then sharp again, you're watching Nike film, you're watching AAU film. You're trying to bring him in for a private workout. Some guys saw him work out in a one on zero in the combine. And that's kind of all you have, you know, you know, the physical tools are there. I talked to teams in the top 10 who say, yeah, I think he'll go in the top 10. It just won't be us. And then I call another one. Yeah, he'll go in the top 10. It just won't be us. Okay, well, if I hear that about if I hear that from enough of you top ten teams, right. uh, at a certain point I'm doing math and I don't know where he's going to go here. So, I think anywhere from four to fourteen, four to fifteen, I would put a range for Sharp at this point. Um, I, I just they're just really difficult. So I'm I'm not going to try to say this is exactly what they look like because no one really knows at this point. Yeah, and I I really like that a night program. I'm getting to work with them a bit in their first year and then the second year seeing a coaching change. And I think that the Ignite program's already had a lot of success and people don't realize how much of an obstacle it's been so far to start that up. I mean, their first year at Shaw there was the COVID season and they, they had these, you know, teenage guys. And I got to give Coach Shaw a lot of credit because, you know, being with them in training camp, you know, talking to them virtually on Zoom and training camp and everything like that, you know, they, he had to keep those teenage kids engaged on top of their responsibilities, just in shape, working out everything while they were well, well at the time, there was no reward in sight in terms of games or in terms of getting your name out there on a public stage while all their peers and friends and buddies are playing at the college ranks on television every night. And you're just having to sit there and buy time. Then eventually they, they did get to go to the bubble and play in that G league circuit, but that wasn't like a real season and still green and coming and everybody else worked out. And then this year, a coaching change happens and again, you're at the showcase, you're at that second half, you know, kind of regular season. Next year, I think we're the first year where you have some consistency, some continuity, and hopefully a full blown season to work with. So I, I do like Miller if he does go to the Ignite program to start to rise his stock a bit. Yeah. And again, to your point, you know, you've got to give Shaw a lot of credit because that first year of Ignite guys, at least in my opinion, is will be the most scrutinized one of all of at least the groups in the first three years based on whoever comes in for the next one. I mean, Kuminga had all the questions around him in there. Jalen Green was as hyped as any prospect we've seen, so there are a lot of questions there. Dacian Nix had a lot of questions, a lot of teams trying to figure stuff out on the back end about him. Same with Isaiah Todd. Like, that had to be difficult to manage. This year, honestly, I'm not going to say it's easy because it's not, but I think with this group, with this, play, with this group of players, you kind of know what you're getting from each of them, and I think it's a little bit of a – simpler evaluation for the NBA teams based on the roles these guys play and what they translate as. But again, that Kuminga green group, like that had to be difficult. And then I agree with you fully that I think Leonard Miller would benefit from going to ignite watching him on the, at the combine, those scrimmages were moving really, really fast for him. They were moving really, really quick. And you could see the flashes of the talent. Again, the length, the coordination, the mobility, the versatility was there. One of the first possessions of that first scrimmage, they put him in a double drag on defense, and he had no clue what the responsibility was. It just looked like he got lost. And I remember texting Matt. I said, "Hey, this this game's moving, you know, really, really quickly. I think he could benefit from a year of you know high level college or the ignite if that's what he wanted to do." So I'm almost hopeful. Again, it doesn't matter to me what he does, 
I'm almost hopeful he goes there because I think he can improve his draft stock significantly um, after a year in the G League versus if he came out right now. So in your line of work of evaluating these guys, both in this class and in next year's class, kind of understanding what's on the Thunder's roster currently, understanding the type of talent they're going to be able to bring in on June 23rd, and then understanding how next year's draft class is supposed to be a very good class, even besides the almighty grail of Victor Wimanyana. It's supposed to still be a really good class next year. With all that information, what is your best guess on when the Thunder will start competing again? I'll say this. That's one that very gingerly I'm going to walk away from uh, and not answer too much of that. I'll say this. If you pick at two and 12, if you pick at two and move up from 12, you are going to add talent that makes it difficult to lose because there is some great talent in this draft, um, especially up in the lottery. Yes, the Holy Grail, Victor Wembanyama, unlike anything we've ever seen. A ridiculous, coordinated, seven foot four kid who can shoot on the move and off the dribble. It's just stupid. Thunder fans, please familiarize yourself. But like I said, I think I said it on the uncontested as well. Like it is, it is going to be difficult. Let's say you come out of this with Chet and Malachi. Let's say you come out of this with Ben Caro and Mark Williams or Ben Caro and AJ Griffin. You you pair that with the youngsters that Thunder already have. I think you're at least looking at a play-in spot. I really do. It's it, At that point, it is a young team, but it is fun. It's big. It's fast. It's versatile. It can score. It can defend. I just think it's very, very difficult to go out there and, and really sink to the bottom. So I have no clue what the plan is. I'm not going to try to guess. Um, but again, let's say you make two lottery picks this year. you got a lot of talent, and I think it's just you're quickly, quickly moving towards winning again. Eric, I appreciate your time. This has been awesome. we got to do it again, but – Thank you again for your time. Let them know where they can find you, you know, your work and everything you're doing uh, on social media and kind of all your other workplaces. Yeah, of course. So my Twitter is just D Murray hoops, just D and then my last name and then hoops uh, basketballnews.com. Matt and I constantly update our mock draft um, updated a couple of days ago. So we'll probably go what is Sunday. We'll probably wait until this coming weekend to do it again, based on what we're hearing. I am going to New York for the draft um, on the 20th or 21st. I'll be up there be doing some TV interviews, radio interviews, all that kind of stuff. And we'll be updating kind of the mock and and some Intel stuff we're hearing leading up to those couple of days as well. So yeah, we appreciate you. Um, Thank you so much for having me on. I always enjoy talking about talking about the draft. Thanks for coming. And again, we got to do this again sometime, especially once we kind of know more about the draft uh, after the draft's over. But again, thank you for joining us. Uh, You can find him on Twitter at D Murray hoops. And then you can find me on Twitter at Ryland underscore styles. And until tomorrow, be good and be good to one another.